Hey, everybody. <laughs> it's the first week of this crazy train of webinars. Uh, and I am wearing my favorite and my only rugby jersey. Uh, not because I'm 59 and it was Guinness established in 1759. Think about that. That's pretty cool. And I'm not even a big Guinness fan, but I am a fan of brands that survived that long, 17 years or whatever before the founding of our country. So that's pretty cool. And, hey, you know, I guess there's some tussling going on, uh, you know, back and forth in Congress, especially between the Republicans and the Democrats. So I'm well re represented in red, white and blue. So anyway, we'll be talking about that. And it's always interesting with Adam and Jack. And um, Jack, I I heard rumor that he's not in uh, Washington, D.C., you know, hiding out behind the podium. I think he's in another location. So we'll see where he's at today. Um, Adam, and I also know, Mike, you sent us a note and we will deal with ERC. We got all kinds of stuff to talk about. Debt ceiling. What's that mean to you? We'll talk about PPP. We'll talk about ERC. We'll talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, hit us up with the Q&A, though, if you would, for the questions. You can harass us in the chat. It'll come, especially if Joe's on. Um, so <laughs> anyway, Adam, you want to do a little bit of your preamble, and then we'll see wherever Jack is today? Yeah, and if you could um, let me share my screen, that'd be awesome, Gary, and then I'll give you the host back. All right, you are now the host. All right, perfect. Yeah, so, you know, a, a couple things. Um, you know, one is on North Carolina and the deductibility of PPP. Remember that both the House and the Senate as part of their respective budget proposals included some deductibility for the PPP expenses. House version was way more favorable than the Senate version. Um, but I couldn't find any research, anything that talked about what they've negotiated, but apparently the current status is now it's down to literally, you know, Phil Berger and Tim Moore meeting directly because the respective Senate and House budget committees have worked through their all the differences they can work through. Now it's their like last motto a motto negotiations. Once they've negotiated, remembering that both these budgets passed with a veto approved majority, they're then going to loop in Cooper. So my only point in saying that is while it will not probably be in time for October 15th when tax returns are due, you know, I do I do feel pretty optimistic that we're going to see some movement on the PPP front that will hopefully get some of those taxes that we've had to have our clients pay in um, to North Carolina uh, come back. So that, that's a welcome piece of good news. Um, on, the, uh, on the federal tax increase side, you know, I, I think we've been talking, hopefully we'll know more in the next week or two weeks around whether or not there's gonna be, <clears throat> you know, tax rate increases affected 2022 or not based on the infrastructure bills. Jack's gonna talk about that in his opening. But one of the things that I did want to bring up that's come up quite a bit is, you know, capital gains tax. And we've had a lot of clients that said, well, should I, should I hurry up and get something done? Meaning presumably sell. And, you know, my take on that has been, look, in the House proposal, the effective date of a capital gains tax rate increase was September 13th, 2021. So if you hadn't already entered into a contract, there's no point in rushing now, you know, to sell anything off because you already missed the window of opportunity. And, you know, the negotiation, obviously this will go through reconciliation process. Maybe that will change, but I don't see any rush to sell anything until you see whether or not something passes because, you know, your window of opportunity for September 13th already passed you know, one, and then second, uh, the, uh, you know, if the House, you know, if the House passes something, goes to the Senate and it reconciles, we'll know a lot more around what they're going to do about that September 13th date, if anything. But last time I checked, you know, that's not something that Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinnamon are all bothered about is September 13th date. It's the level of spending, not 
you know, the tax differences themselves, because the tax differences that the House has proposed and the Senate voted on are largely what Joe Manchin has been aligned with. You know, it's his capital gains rate. It's his corporate tax rate. It's his, you know, uh, income tax rates. It's more the spending side that he's got a problem with. So with that in mind, what I did want to share, you know, because uh, Gary and I like to argue a lot and I like to remind him of um, the facts. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> it is that, you know, this is a graph of the federal deficit. I mean, if you went back in time to Eisenhower, it wouldn't look radically different. It's just the dollar values would change a lot. But, you know, honestly, when you're talking about the federal deficit, that's the amount of money that the federal government spends, including having to pay its debt relative to the amount of tax revenues that it, that it brings in. So, you know, Every, in every year that so every year that we have a deficit, we keep on adding to, you know, the amount that we're in excess. So when they talk about raising the federal debt limit, you know, they've had it on the news. You know, some people are listening to it, other people aren't. It just would behoove us to talk about well, what are they really talking about? You know, that that's really saying, you know, for all these orange, you know, dark orange bars, which is deficit spending, which we clearly see have been going on since President Bush. <laughs> you know, so he was bad. These were tax cuts, unpaid for wars, and a prescription drug benefit that was not paid for. That's Bush. Then he rolls into the Great Recession. That's Obama. Then some Obamacare. <laughs> um, coming through here. And then we got Trump. And these are didn't rein in any, in any spending and did a tax cut and then a pandemic. So when they're talking about raising the federal debt limit, that isn't for, you know, extrapolating out for this $3.5 trillion bill. I mean, you'd have to raise that debt limit in the future year. This is all about paying for this crap that's already been incurred under three administrations, two Republican one Democrat. So I just think, you know, generally when people get all kind of hot bothered about, ah! <laughs> you know, just remember that pretty much no administration, no Congress since Clinton and Gingrich, you know, I can't believe we're all wishing we had them back, but since Clinton and Gingrich were able to actually produce a budget surplus, everybody since then has spent like a drunken freaking sailor um, in Bangkok. <laughs> so it's pretty much been equal opportunity offenses. So all this kind of, oh my gosh, you know, it's that side, it's that side, you know, y'all need to, it's both you, both you suck. <laughs> um, so, you know, kind of the, the difference is now is that, you know, this pandemic spending was unfunded, the tax cut was unfunded. Now they're just talking about raising taxes to at least fund and not make this much worse than it already is, is the point of the tax. So they want to spend money like drunken sailors, but they're also talking about raising taxes to cover the money that they want to spend like drunken sailors. So it's like, whether you agree with social spending or not, which is part of the $3.5 trillion proposal, the tax rate increases to at least, you know, not make this deficit thing worse than it already is. So, and then I'm not bringing up the graph, but on the whole, um, economic argument about tax cuts stimulate the economy. Um, that's just, that's not correct. I mean, the only time that's actually occurred in recent history was under Reagan, but that's when the top marginal rate was 70%. And it was a very temporary blip. Outside of that, there is no correlation between a tax rate decrease and the economy going up to subsequently pay for it. Those have moved independent of each other. The only thing that there's a correlation to is tax rate decrease. Economy stays the same because tax rate decreases don't work to stimulate the economy. Tax rate decrease, unfunded and not paid for. Don't want to cut any spending. Deficit goes up. Oh, I know what we'll do instead. 
we'll get we'll spend a lot of money on social programs, <laughs> you know, because those people, once we spend money on social programs, they'll start spending that money and that'll boost the economy. Guess what? That doesn't work either. <laughs> so <laughs> it's all the libertarian says it's all bad. <laughs> so just be honest and be honest and say it's all bad. <laughs> anyway. I'll shut up with that and turn it over to Jack for a positive. <laughs> well, it's a good thing I'm wearing a, a Guinness uh, rugby shirt because there's a lot yeah. of references to drunken sailor spending. Yeah, so that 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 could be a solution that instead of dealing with our problems, we'll just go drink and hopefully forget about them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we don't need to do that. All yeah. right, Jack, where the heck are you? All right, so before the big reveal. Um, a couple of a, a little bit of explanation. So, you know, we've been talking about things like obviously the, the money infrastructure or stimulus bills about people getting involuntarily shot up and the, the you know, problems that employers face and those kind of things. But, you know, and, and we talk about and we kind of tend to forget kind of the more personal and impact of COVID in relation to us as neighbors to each other as humans and kind of just, you know, we kind of lose our minds sometimes. So, decided to uh, go into a different venue and share with you an, an important story that I think we need to keep in mind. And so um, I'm coming to, and, and before I big do the big reveal, whoever, whoever's fastest on the chat line gets a $10 certificate that has to Ooh. tell me where I am. All right. And so here it goes. Three, two, one, one and a half order <laughs> oh, wait, no, no no pre guessing all right here we go that's where i am all right so i'm going to read you this story it's where's your important. sweater uh hanging up on my door behind okay. yeah you can't see it. it's off screen oh off, yeah off set. <laughs> lisa lisa was fastest on the draw oh okay all right all right all right so here's the story this is from edison new jersey Tony Cesaro, the bingo director at St. Helena Church, unlocked the door to the parish hall from inside. It was two hours before the night's first game, but already 62 players were standing in the parking lot. The jackpot was high at a little over $4,000. Players had been unruly of late. To restore order, Mr. Cesaro set up a rope line and mandated that they pre-order packages of game tickets via text message. Now, 106 gamblers were on the reservation list, as he read off the first 12 names, 20 players surged forward past others, some who leaned on canes for balance. The pandemic forced many churches to close for more than a year. In some spots, security guards and good Samaritans struggled to keep the peace at the door. Patience, said Nell Valentin, 63, as she watched a middle-aged woman hold her elderly mother's hand so as to not lose her to the rush of players. Okay. Um, there are people that are losing their minds. And so I'm just saying that, okay, a little bit of patience, a little bit of love, a little bit of grace will go a long way, uh, not just only in the bingo lines, but, you know, supermarkets and everything else. So um, I know that we're all getting kind of frustrated and like, okay, wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, forgetting to wear a mask and having to go back to the car to get the mask. I mean, all those things, right? So, all right. Uh, on a more serious note, so um, I'm going to read you some sound bites of things, starting with the president yesterday said, we've got three things to do, the debt ceiling, the continuing resolution, and two pieces of legislation. Um, I would argue that those are four. You can't really just put the two pieces of legislation together and say, oh, it's just one thing. It's really two things, right? So um, here, some more... The, Here's this quote. Um, the rec reconciliation bill is designed to be a deficit. Uh, you're going to love this one. Um, is designed to be a deficit and debt neutral. In other <laughs> words, the tax increases. <laughs> it gets better. The tax increases cover the cost of the programs and targeted tax cuts without adding to the national debt. Senate and House moderates want the bottom line trimmed significantly. So they're basically saying, well, it's supposed to be gender, it's supposed to be neutral, but we would rather it be reduced, right? So there's that. Um, I do want to, be, before going out into a little bit into the, the what's going on in Capitol Hill, is to make sure that people understand the, the differences between the continuing reg resolution and the debt ceiling uh, issue. So um, the two things, funding the federal government's operations and raising the federal debt ceiling. So 
um, as far as the, the funding, the government. So basically it's a line of credit and it's how the government pays its employees and, and really functions and everything else. So these appropriations expire at midnight tonight. And so if uh, the statement is, if new appropriations are not signed into law by that time, the government will shut down and federal employees may once again, uh, once again face furloughs. And the debt ceiling is related to um, the amount of debt the U.S. government is legally allowed to carry, and that expires in mid-October. And so the failure to increase the debt ceiling would le lead to default, a potential economic recession, and additional furloughs. So those, that's, I want to make sure that, you know, some people have asked me, well, you know, it, it just kind of sounds all the same. Is it a matter of just kind of moving the ball and printing more money and, you know, all kinds of things? So not necessarily. So let's get kind of to the core things. So um, statement by uh, Speaker Pelosi that she wants to pass the bill today, but she left wiggle room to delay the vote. The legislation which passed the Senate last month is opposed by scores of progressive Democrat lawmakers who say they want progress on legislation to bolster the social safety net, which is the bigger one, the $3.5 trillion versus the $1 trillion infrastructure bill. And so what you have is, and, and if you were listening to NPR this morning, it is one person that is holding on the Democratic side that is holding all this up, which is obviously not Joe true, Manchin. but they're um, Joe Manchin and uh, his counterpart, um, uh, Kristen, Sin is it Cinema? Cinema of Arizona. Um, and they call it the Manchin Cinema issue. So as of, this is a report of 4.30 this morning. I don't know where things are at. I haven't had a chance to check before we got on this morning, but um, they support or they, they oppose it. Um, but they haven't said, well, what's the number? Everybody keeps asking them, the president, uh, everybody, the senators are asking, okay, what's your number? What's your counter proposal? What do you want to trim, et cetera? And it's just not happening. Um, the, part of the infighting is, is that you have senators who say that we are not going to push this $1 trillion bill through until we get the $3.5 trillion bill uh, further along and potentially close to being final. You remember two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when all this came up, it's like, okay, September 29th, September 30th, are they really going to be able to do it? And there were promises made, all kinds of promises. And so, uh, and then there are others who said, we never said that. It, we never agreed to that. It was all, you know, it was to be that we make progress on two parallel tracks. And at the same time, rather than going in serial, we're going in parallel. And so, um, that's really what the, the, the main issue is, is that, okay, people are trying to, to keep them tethered together when, and, and it's stalling out everything. So that's, that's why you hear about, well, you know, why, why is this being held up? Who is doing it? Can't they just do it in baby steps? Well, there's people who want to do it in baby steps. If you consider spending trillions of dollars, baby steps, but you know, 1 trillion versus 3.5 trillion. So that's really kind of what's going on in the background. And, and as I said, I just wanted to give you a little bit of that so you understand, kind of get the Cliff Notes version of the um, what's been going on. And, and if anybody knows if something significant has happened in the past hour or two, you know, please share that on the chat. But I, I'm not aware of that. But I um, admittedly have not been looking in the past two hours. You mean you've actually been doing paid work? Yeah, no. I do no, on no. occasion. <laughs> oh man, well, hit us up with questions, y'all. Um, and uh, the chat has been interesting <laughs> today. <laughs> it, and Joe, you 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 kind of win the uh, <laughs> the most creative <laughs> chat so far. I feel like I've turned into another episode of Jeopardy, only unlike. Matt, um, Amadio, who has won for 31 days in a row, we are the losers. <laughs> you know, you're not the loser. You're on here. <laughs> so anyway, um, here's a question from Mike, though, going back to ERC. So kind of go back in your memory banks here. Uh, question is the same question I asked in late August. What's going on with ERC for Q4? Is it ending tomorrow or at the end of the year or is it still up in the air if it's still up in the air what does adam think will happen and when 
Yeah. Um, so good, good question. Uh, so two things, first off to address, um, Jack's comment, anything new, it, it looks like keeping the government open, which is just the shutdown piece that looks like it's going to pass today. That the just announcement that Republicans and Democrats in the Senate both agreed that they would do that. Um, but to Mike's question around the employer retention tax credit, so the Senate infrastructure bill, which was the small infrastructure bill at a, at a paltry $1 trillion, <laughs> um, but for, for real infrastructure, not human infrastructure, um, that included a provision that accelerated the end of the employer retention tax credit to <laughs> September 30th of this year. So my own feeling on it is that today is September 30th. It still hadn't passed the house. Why the land is that baby goes to the end of the year. So I can't, I, I'm getting, I'm going to say that I see that just being negotiated out is my own feeling that if, if the infrastructure bill passes, it's still got to go to, you know, some form of reconciliation. I don't, I don't see him going retroactive on it. So could they say, look, it stops effective, you know, whatever date, you know, we actually pass the legislation, maybe, but unless something passes today, I really feel like, look, it's going to stick with the law of the land and the law of the land was through the end of the year. So, you know, the, the more time that expires, the more time's on your side. So like if I was betting, um, which my kid's kind of gambler, um, if I was betting, you know, I give it better that better I wouldn't say, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stake my life on this <laughs> outcome, but I give it better than 50-50 that it's gonna be in place through the end of the year. Cause that's not, that's just not worth that's not enough money that that's worth dying on the hill for. Uh, a couple questions um, that have come in. One from Bruce, any idea as to whether North Carolina two-year budget will be approved or vetoed by the governor. There are implications on education, broadband, and state implications, state tax um, implications. I don't, I, what I'd said at the opening of the webinar is that it, in theory, it doesn't matter if he does veto it because it was passed with the, the original drafts that got reconciled between the House and Senate were passed with the veto-proof majority. So, and they, they, they all included some spending increases. So, you know, if, if you're Cooper and you're going to veto, what are you going to veto it for? You know, because there's probably some, you know, unfunding of something that you really liked or alternatively it didn't spend enough. But even then, it, you know, in theory, it passed with veto-proof majorities. So it really... It shouldn't matter, you know, if he vetoes it or not. All right. No, another question here is when should we expect to receive 2020 employee tax credit we applied for over three months ago? Um, you know, the, the earliest that we'd seen was about five months. So, you know, keep... Hopefully you've not been holding your breath this long, but I did hear that the free diving champion did hold his breath for nine minutes. Um, five months would be a long time, but I think if the earliest that we've seen is five months, then you could probably peg it at probably five to seven months. Yeah, that's what we've been hearing from ERC today. Um, so here's a, here's a question. What do you do if the Democrats ax the backdoor Roth individual retirement account strategy, any thoughts? Um, well, I mean, if they ax the back, the Roth backdoor, so what the Roth backdoor strategy is, is that, you know, when you get to, when you get, when, when you get above a certain income level, contributing to a traditional Roth IRA isn't a tax deduction. So like if I contribute, you know, a thousand bucks into a Roth IRA, but my AGI is too high, I don't get a tax deduction for that. 
um, but I can still be in the Roth, which means the earnings are going to grow um, tax-free. Well, what, what you have the ability to do is to convert, regardless of income level currently, those um, Roth IRAs, sorry, those IRAs into Roth IRAs, <laughs> um, which means now you've got, you, you already had some post-tax money because you didn't get a deduction in the first place. You're allowed to convert it into a Roth so you can take advantage of all the provisions of the Roth IRA because there's no income limitation on it. So, you know, it is a good strategy of getting some pre-tax gains to convert to um, post-tax gains for real people with really um, high incomes without really having a tax consequence. And the, the, the Senate is, or the, the legislation that's been proposed has said, hey, we're not going to allow people to do that anymore. Um, so my thought on that is, again, not retroactive. So I would consider employing that as a year-end strategy, potentially. Jack, Mr. Rogers is not in his head. <laughs> uh, yeah, what he question... said. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to yeah. add. You know, I... <laughs> Mr. Rogers, man, we, we could use some more Mr. Rogers. I mean, even as a kid, though, he was kind of cringeworthy for me. I mean, like, I don't know. <laughs> His, his puppets kind of freak me out. Um, so here's, a, here's an interesting question. And this is, not, this is not a political question at all, all right? So, but this really is probably more a Jack question. So across, like, I think it was on MSN that hit me today uh, with an article that the state of New York is basically saying, I, 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 from what I remember, it was like 70,000 unvaccinated healthcare workers that were refusing to be vaccinated for one reason or the other. Um, if they quit or they were fired, they were going to be denied unemployment insurance. Is that, is that legal? So... Can I say maybe and, and punt on now? Oh, that um, would be such a jack move. <laughs> of, of course, yeah. of course, you know, it's part of my profession. So the, the reality is, it, and, and so it's not just in New York, it is in other places. I mean, it's here locally. I think Novant uh, said, hey, yeah, don't come to work. Um, and, and there's other places. And I have had some of my partners in the other offices in our labor and actually uh, some guys here too, that have gone on the record uh, on local news channels that said, hey, look, at, the, at this point, um, private employers, as long as it's not discriminatory, um, and then even going as far as saying that there are some um, governing bodies of different religions in the US that have said that you know we're, we're not taking a religious stance, meaning we're not objecting on religious grounds for this. Uh, to get the shot. And so what you have is, is that um, with your particular question is, all right, so you're entitled to unemployment in most cases, if you are involuntarily removed without cause, essentially. So you're, you're basically, hey, sorry, we don't need your help anymore. So if, and, and most people who are terminated will take a shot at the, you know, getting their unemployment and then, um, uh, newer employers or who don't have experience will come to us and say, hey, we got this, what do we do with it? But then you very easily get trained to say, okay, I know how to respond. Yes, this person was terminated on this date for four cause and therefore is not entitled to unemployment, et cetera. And so what they're saying is this is termination for, essentially reading between the lines is termination for cause. Uh, and so therefore you're not entitled to these benefits uh, and so don't go looking for them. Again, another point of litigation. Uh, and yeah. although in this instance, it may be that the regulators will, will swoop in and say, this is our interpretation of a termination 
for not being vaccinated and being asked to not come to the workplace, that it is for cause or it's uh, not for cause. And so they would be subject to unemployment. But the default at this point, which makes sense just because it's, you know, they're, they're saying that the reason you can't come to work is because you have violated our policy. We have a policy, we put it in place, you've decided to um, not comply with that policy. So therefore it's a termination for cause. So that's how that all kind of comes together and ultimately results in a denial of that benefit. So here's another one that came across um, actually early this week, and uh, they may be a referral that I make to you, Jack, um, but they, they're trying to go without lawyers at this point, but here's what? the scenario. I know. <laughs> I'm like, man, I don't know that I would fight this one. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> I'd go to Jack's firm. Um, but here's the deal. So this is a, um, it, they, they do post-tension concrete for multifamily home builders, right? So for large general contractors, they um, were told, and they've got, you know, kind of a mix of, of people that have chosen the vaccine, some that have not, and they've, you know, they're trying to just you know, like everybody trying to straddle the line and like they, they care about their people and that sort of thing. And they're also trying to honor personal decisions or whatever. Well, they, they got this multi-million dollar contract and then they signed the contract. And then afterwards, the, um, the general contractor that had hired him. And, and again, these guys are all working outside. They are, you know, taking mud and turning it into concrete, you know, so they're outside. Um, the general contractor basically said, um, in following the CDC's recommendation, um, not a mandate, but a recommendation, we're asking and we're mandating basically that all our subcontractors uh, be on job sites fully vaccinated. And we're demanding that you basically ensure that all your people, well, all of their people, not all of them are their own employees. They've got a bunch of contractors and subs as well. And, and they're like, well, so now we've got the onus to go chase down a bunch of people that are outside of our control. I mean, there, there's like, it's, it's this dicey either way you go, you know, what do you, what do you do in that kind of a situation? Yeah, it's funny because it's to, um, Adam, there's a little bit of back feed in, on your mic. I'm going to mute uh, Okay. And so as soon as you started, you know, a few 30 seconds into your explanation, I knew exactly where you're going with this because um, I've seen it. Uh, on landlord tenant issues, uh, sub tenancies. I've seen it in the construction industry, the service industry, um, equipment product uh, um, distribution industry. So for example, reviewing a contract and it's in there. And um, so keep in mind that many contracts, it's kind of like follow, you know, choose your adventure. And what they'll do is they will embed links to additional terms and conditions of the contract. And they'll have language in there that says, and you agree that you will comply with any modifications to the terms and conditions after you sign this document. And then it will say that um, you are then responsible for knowing the changes for terms and conditions. So we're not going to tell you, you get to go maybe every six months or so and go find those things. And they're immediately binding. So you can see I have all these layers. And so when, when I get something like that, I'm peeling away the layers, which is that uh, you have to expressly tell us it can't be implemented by in less than 30 days or whatever the appropriate time period is. And it allows us, if we don't want to comply with it, to terminate the contract uh, because they are not going to allow you to dictate the terms and conditions. If, if they have the leverage, they're not going to allow you to dictate the terms and conditions now or later. 
and it's it's come up a lot in the context of safety protocols for COVID. And as you said, the control of well, certainly there's a, there is an expectation you're going to be able to control your own employees that you get to choose the independent contractors that you use as subcontractors if you're the subcontractor, so the sub subs. And but once you start getting further away from being able to validate and verify their status, um, but it ultimately comes down to uh, to the responsibility of the contracting party. And if you agree that you will abide by those terms and conditions, which may be changed in their sole discretion, and it's and they change it to you need to do this, then I, I think that's that's more of a problem to do it after the fact, but it's not that it is impermissible. I think that you get into is it done in good faith? Is it done as a way to create an issue to create a, an issue for cause to terminate that contract? And so what I've been, what I've been doing is on, on the front end is making sure that the people who are going to sign on the dotted line of that contract for my client have gone through those terms and conditions, or they say, Jack, we need you to. And I'm like, okay, um, if it's like a federal contract, I'm like, I don't think you want me to be doing that because I, you will probably pay me more than the value of that contract in some cases. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but uh, so the, those are the things you need to be aware of is, you know, really read the terms of the contract, look for those rabbit holes that they say, uh, click here, you know, any, any other, ter other terms and conditions applicable to this contract appear at this website and you hereby agree to whatever's on that website. So that's, that's where people get the most in trouble. Um, like I said, it's, it's, you, you build in the safeguards to provide notice and the opportunity to stay in or get out, uh, which is easier said than done. Meaning that, you know, when you're nose deep in the middle of a project, a construction project, is it going to be, you know, is it really going to be economically feasible for you to, to get out? And then what do you do? Uh, maybe it, there's been scenarios where, as you might imagine, that the writing says what it says, but then everybody's look, turning a blind eye. It's like, yeah, okay, you know, eh, until something happens. And then when something happens, everybody goes to the documents and they say, we told you you had to do this. You didn't do it. Therefore, you're responsible. But we haven't been wearing masks for three months. You know, I don't care. Um, yeah. Now, there is, there is a, 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 a tenet of equitable law that would say that possibly the behavior has modified the contract so that that becomes essentially an amendment. But then you have language in the contract that usually says that no amendments are effective unless they're in writing and signed by, by all of the parties that it impacts. So um, you know, course of performance, course of dealing can modify contracts in some instances. But you know, th those are all very difficult and expensive roads to go down to, to litigate. So you just need to be on notice and aware of, aware of your surroundings, meaning what's in the agreement and what you're agreeing to, not just now, but in the future. Yeah. Bottom line is, is, uh, you know, if there's, you know, their take was, Hey, this was not in the agreement. We signed an agreement. Now we're ready to start pouring and we got a new modification but to your point there may be some gotcha language in the original contract that they're not aware of and if that's the case what are you going to do so um and, and it, it, it can to, be a challenge also gary that um if if you're provided a written contract with a hyperlink in it it's like okay um how are you going to get to that and then even in electronic contracts the hyperlink is there, but it's just, it's white noise. It's like, okay, well, you know, standard terms and conditions. It's like, if you pay late, we're going to charge interest. Well, no, there's a lot more to that and uh, insurance indemnification uh, things. And, and when it's a master contract situation where that's the master contract and you have all these SOW statements of work or, um, uh, you know, and, yeah. and other things, it, the, all those terms apply to those to those conditions down the road or to the performance of the work. So it can be pretty extensive and permeate through the services or the goods that you're providing under this master contract. So it can have significant um, additive or cumulative 
impact on your work, your cash flow, and everything else. If, especially, I mean, it, it, it's in most contracts will allow you to suspend your performance for the other side's breach in most cases. So, hey, I'm not going to pay you until you start doing this stuff, you know? And so then it's like, well, and maybe it's, it's as easy as getting a box of masks and throwing them out and saying, wear these, but you know, usually it's not that easy. So anyway. Yeah. In this case, it was forced, forced, uh, vaccinations, you know, which, I mean, that's dicey and it's, you know, emotionally charged in a lot of, a lot of ways. So, um, interesting. I remember <laughs> my first business mentor, a long time ago said, Gary, you work really hard to win the business. Then you work really hard to get the business done. And then you work really hard to get paid for what you did. <laughs> and now we're adding even more layers now. And I mean, he's 90 some still kicking, um, but I don't think he's in business anymore. But man, uh, it seems like the hurdles just keep getting higher. Um, all right, question here from David. The labor pool is already strained in the construction industry. From my experience, blue collar workers are less likely to be vaccinated. Yeah, and that's what one of their concerns was. If Novant and Atrium really go through and require all workers to be vaccinated, they'll most likely be doubling the amount of time for uh, construction projects to be completed. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it, it, these are strange times. <laughs> that, that, and that's a very interesting observation and, and, and accurate. And I would say if, if you were, um, if you made that statement to a, an anti-vaxxer or, I mean, there, there's two sides. It's like, okay, well, if, if we force people to get vaccinations and we don't put the, or the alternative or the consequences, you don't work, then yes, that obviously impacts our labor force. The flip side of that is, okay, well, let's just have a free for all and everybody shows up and then people get sick and then people are, are at home, uh, not sitting on their couches because they want to, but because they have to, because they're not vaccinated and they got other people sick. So I, I you know, I don't, I'm not going to take a position either way. I mean, it's, you know, we're vaccinated and we made that choice, but we also took into account, um, and I think I even said here on this program a couple weeks ago, you know, apologize to my kids that, you know, well, this is the best that we could do for you as parents at this point, making the decision, and hopefully it doesn't impact you 30, 40 years down the road um, when, you know, we're gone, so. Right. Wisdom is required. Uh, good comments, good questions. Anything else? Um, have you seen any late breaking news? Do we have anything before midnight? No, <laughs> Adam's been monitoring, <laughs> but you know, Mr. Rogers, um, stoplight is not either red or yellow or green. I mean, yeah, today yeah. it would be probably yellow <laughs> going towards the red, <laughs> Yeah, they said if I plugged in too much stuff, it's going to blow the fuse. So I didn't plug in the light. That, okay, that there you go. Yeah, yeah. But I do have a good dad joke, and this is a good one. Oh, my goodness. It wouldn't be um, one of our webinars without one of those gems. It's, 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 been, it's been a while. I've been saving up. I saw this. This, this is uh, from Saturday, right? I'm a little put my calendar. All right. What do you call Darth Vader when he's nervous? I'm already laughing. <laughs> That's Ready? great when you're laughing at your own joke and you know the punchline. All right, hit it. Panic in Skywalker. Oh, come on. That's that's hilarious. Oh, Panic in Skywalker. Man, I don't know. We, we're gonna have to start doing some polls. <laughs> Lisa goes, no. <laughs> All right, Lisa. Now I'm not oh, sending. I'm not sending you that certificate. Now you just revoked it. <laughs> Do you happen to have Lisa's uh, email, by the way? Um, probably, but go ahead and Lisa, if you don't mind sending it to me or to Gary, and then he'll send it to me, and then I'll yeah, get that's you. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here's another question, David. Thanks for weighing in on this. 
Along the same line, what happens if they enforce the vaccination requirement on construction workers and uh, there's a timeline for work to be completed in the contract, would the work completion timeline still be enforceable? Ooh, boy, that's a good question. That is an awesome question um, because now you're getting into, uh, if, if it's a contract that was entered into recently, uh, whoever drafted it, if they were um, being mindful, there is a pandemic and epidemic provision in the force majeure. And so any um, prevention suspension of performance that is called by, caused by a force majeure event, which can now be linked back to the pandemic epidemic, that um, I would say, okay, you know, creative argument is, is that um, it's, uh, you know, it, is, did that, does that excuse performance because of that, because we can't get it done on a timely basis. So therefore it's not a breach. So in, in not that I was, you know, uh, I don't know, um, with significant foresight, it's just that uh, in, in force majeure clauses, you should of good course have a, a, an outside limit to that. And depending on what it is and what industry, et cetera. So if it's a, a lease and then, um, you know, or, or whatever, you know, construction or anything else that you have a maximum amount of time. The reality is if, if that contracting party can't perform, what are the possibilities other contracting parties can perform that same work? So, or is it really kind of individualized to that particular company that can't perform? So you have to go and cover yourself in order to proceed forward. And so you get into those situations, but I think that the, it, it, it it has created a creative way of not being in breach because of the pandemic. But yeah, it's, yeah, as far as I know that something like that has not been litigated because we're really kind of new at putting that stuff into these contracts uh, to be very explicit that that's a force majeure event. And in some cases, you're very specific as to what the, what is the, what happens in the force majeure events. So if it's something that has uh, a material impact on the contract um, or cannot be unreasonably circumvented or, or dealt with. So for example, you can't hire other people as substitutes or you can't get that component elsewhere. I mean, so a good example is uh, if, uh, I doubt that many of you are buying new cars these days. Um, they're being built, they're being stored in groups of hundreds, but they're missing a little, a little chip about this big that goes in the car that is part of the brain of the car because they can't be produced. So, you know, as much as I might want a, a new car and there's no way I'm going to pay the price for it, I'm going to wait until the, um, and I shouldn't say this, I represent car dealerships, so don't tell them, <laughs> but um I, I'm going to wait until the market is flooded because the prices will come down once they start putting those chips in the cars and when they're manufactured. And there's some companies that have opened up production facilities specifically for those chips, including domestic and foreign manufacturers, the, the, the um, manufacturers of the cars themselves, not the uh, uh, goods providers that have traditionally been manufacturing that. So it's kind of like survival to set up your own shop, to be able to produce your own chips, to put in your own cars kind of thing. So, so that's a long way to way yeah. of saying that, yes, that's, that potentially is a force majeure event. That's good. And, and David says, Hey, I'm not trying to take a stance on the vaccine. No, we get it, man. I mean, you know, it's like, we're, all, but that, those are really good questions. Um, and I mean, I'm sure I, you are not the only one wondering about them. I know, I, you know, not to not to play the other side of the argument, um, but pre-pandemic, same conversation. I can't find people that can pass a drug test, you know. And if if if, if a contract had in a clause, your folks got to be clean, <laughs> you know, like you know that <laughs> it's kind of. You know, I understand it like from the, from the, you know, 
end user's point of view, I could see them thinking it's not really any different. I mean, you got people on site, my people are at risk, blah, 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 blah. So I don't know, I kind of kind of look at it as the, the first place that I think we've really seen this show up in force is on Department of Defense contracts. And if you're doing work there at a, at a military base or VA hospital or whatever, you know, this is starting to show up. Yeah, another interesting place where it shows up is in drafting leases um, moving forward, which is for two reasons. One is um, construction. If there, if there is like in the franchise world, so the franchisor has expectations and requirements in the franchise agreement that you will be up and running after a certain period of time. So in the franchise agreements, you build in essentially a, a force majeure clause specifically related to the construction and opening and operation of the business. And then also lease related is when you have variable rent to be paid um, and it's based on a certain model. And um, you know, I, I have not seen as many of those because clients are not willing to get into those. They want a fixed rent. And, and so, but the ones that are variable rent that are you know, part of gross sales, because that's just the way it is, is that even though maybe the base rent is lower just because of the pandemic. And so the variable, but the variable rate, there's even negotiation and discussion on the variable rate to a point where that if you model and you pro forma what you think the performance is, and then it drops below a certain amount, then that um, excuses payment of the variable rent component uh, for whatever period of time it is. Uh, and there's various interesting creative ways to construct something like that. Um, but it's basically because if, what if people, for example, a restaurant um, decide that, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to um, come in and eat anymore. I think that was more of a problem in, you know, last year, but I think a lot of businesses have pivoted to be able to deal with that, uh, including, upping their game on their apps so that, you know, you don't really have to minimal contact with uh, your order. You put your credit card in and magically your food comes out at some point in the park designated parking spot that you put into the app and things like that. So, um, but the, it, it does have an impact and, and gives you the ability with a little more leverage on pricing essentially, whether it's a lease or otherwise. Uh, in other terms, uh, in the in kind of the spirit of force majeure, that there is something external that is going to impact your performance of your business. Now, keep in mind that the the force majeure concept is a construct of trying to address the unknown. So it's kind of um, you know a, a little bit conflicting or inconsistent to say that. Be, we, we, what we don't know is the impact necessarily of the results, but we know that it's here and we know that there's going to be a problem. So if I'm on the end of trying to enforce something and saying this is not a force majeure event, you know, I'm going to have to focus on what the impact of it is, not the event or occurrence of it to say, well, we're in an epidemic pandemic. So, you know, there must be an impact. It's like, well, no, what were the economic consequences of that? And was that unknown? Or are we at a point where Delta variant has gotten us by the hold, you know, gotten a hold of us. So you can't use a Delta variant as a, as a force majeure event because you knew it was there. And then therefore you should be negotiating those lease terms for reduction in variable rent, extended period of time to construct the business so that the franchise order doesn't hold you in default and those kind of things. So, um, you know, it's, it's, we know more than we did before in, in, as a contracting party, you're going to be held accountable for uh, that and not being able to use that as an excuse for performance or payment. Well, Amazon has made out really well during this period of time. And I think it's clear that the attorneys, the demand for attorneys is going up. And uh, unfortunately, with the uh, North Carolina dragging their heels the good news is, is it looks like they are going to uh, allow those PVP expenses to be deducted. The bad news is, is um, if you're a client or uh, whether it be us or anybody else, and you've had to file already, you're going to have to file um, ex amendments, which will 
costs some money, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to what you're going to get back. So anyway, um, also, we had almost 60 people on um, a really interesting panel yesterday. We were going to do it in person. We made the call about a month ago to go virtually. So we had about 60 people, which we wouldn't have been able to. We, 40 is really a nice size for us in our community room. But we had a four-person panel, different industries represented on the title of the Great Resignation, which hopefully you're not experiencing, but just the whole idea of hiring, retaining, and re-engaging employees in the, in the middle of this. Really good. It's up on the YouTube, on the BGW CPA YouTube uh, channel. Um, really very interesting discussion and things that apply to everybody that is employing anybody. Uh, so I encourage you to go see that. Um, last call for questions. You will miss my ugly face next week. I'm going to be with some friends that I haven't seen for a long time. And so I am taking some days off to be see uh, some old acquaintances. And I say old. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'll miss you guys. But um, do you remind eight, Adam where the eight, record eight. button is? Yeah, that's exactly right. Fortunately, we're on autopilot. As soon as we go live, it's recording, which is great. Uh, if anybody came in late on this, we will put it up on the BGW CPA YouTube channel later on today. Thanks for all the fun chat and for the great questions. Really, really good. Uh, everybody behaved themselves really well. That's great. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, Be nice at bingo. Be nice at bingo. Be more like Mr. Rogers, you know, without the sweater, I guess. I don't know. Sweater's optional. <laughs> so, Adam, anything last uh, before we sign off? No, um, just, you know, nothing, nothing different from the opening tirade, which is, um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not good with hypocrisy. The level of hypocrisy on all sides of any discussion around, you know, taxing, spending, social programs is just hogwash. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So the one thing that we can do about that is just be honest ourselves. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a need for that. That's right. Right. That's right. I mean. <laughs> be more like Mr. Rogers, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I haven't seen that documentary or that movie on him. Have you, Jack? I haven't. I haven't seen it. the, the Tom Hanks remake of it. I haven't seen that. Yeah. Either, so, um, yeah. My mom saw it and said it was really good. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, I guess I'll have to do that. Now that you've been there, I don't know where you're going to be next week, but I'll be looking for it on the BGW CPA YouTube channel when I get back. All right, we're going to go ahead and sign off, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for your questions. And um, again, if uh, let's see who Lisa, if you don't happen to have my email address, it's gfrey at trustbgw.com, and I will for your contact information to Jack so that he can make good on your lickety split answer on knowing exactly where he was. So it's good stuff. Y'all have a great day. See you later. Thank you. Bye.